Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to MacKillop United Church on this uh, long weekend Sunday. It's so wonderful to see all of you online and all of you who are in person this morning. I hope you're doing well and uh, and uh, f- feeling the spring uh, energy and uh, embodying your life as we gather this morning. My name is uh, Trevor Potter. I'm the minister here, and just a special thank you to our uh, our choir today for joining us, Ken Rogers as the director, and, and John Paul as our accompanist. And then we also have our thanks to our welcome hosts, uh, Gail and uh, Silvano today, who are here, and as always, our tech crew at the back. As we gather each and every Sunday here at McKillop, we always affirm each other. Whoever we are and however we identify ourselves, this is a place for us to be and to celebrate all of who we are and to accept all who we are as we join together today. I'd like to invite us into a, uh, a call of worship as we gather today, um, and I invite you to read the bold. We are a people of holding on or of letting go, holding on to rigid ideas or holding on to certainty of how things should be, or holding on to what makes us comfortable, or holding on to what makes us safe, or With this flame, this symbol of our spiritual tradition, let it be a symbol of burning up the ties that hold us back from being our true self, reaching our true potential, being inclusive and open community. Let us be a symbol of lighting a new way for us into a better tomorrow, and let it be a symbol of letting go and finding new chances. And so we light this Christ candle which is a symbol of all this, of letting go, of opening to new life, of new chances, of knowing that there is always a light within us and around us, for us, and with us as we're on this journey together. I invite us now to join together into an opening prayer. It's going to be beginning with a, a meditation of of breathing, of guided breathing, which is, which is, you may think in the Christian tradition might be weird, but it's actually one of the ancient prayers of our tradition was uh, becoming conscious of our breath because it is really the breath of God that breathes through all of creation in us. And so as we, as we become aware of our breath, it, it helps us to become embodied into our bodies, into our hearts and minds. At a, as a, at a physiological level, actually when we do mindful breathing, it actually helps us to get out of our, what's called our reptilian brain, our amygdala of flight, flight, freeze. And then it allows us to come more into our other parts of our brain and into our heart. So it has many, it has many ways that when we do this together, It helps connect us and bring us together. So you might want to close your eyes. You might want to put your feet on the ground, sort of sit up in a way that allows you to breathe deeply. And as we begin, I invite you just to take in a deep breath and be aware of your breath and the breath of life as we join together in prayer. God, as we gather this day, sometimes we hold on to a lot. Many of us carry burdens of worry, anxiety over the state of the world, worries about money, about our environment, our families, about peace and justice. 
And so we take in a, a deep breath or two and let go of these for a moment to be more deeply in ourselves and you and with each other. And so we breathe. God, may we trust that as we breathe and let go, as we breathe and be here, as we breathe and be in our bodies, that nothing will get worse for us putting down these burdens for a moment. May we let go of them with our breath for all that weighs us down this morning. May we find that we can set down our worries here and now and then longer moments in our lives as we learn to breathe with you in this moment. experience, O oh Spirit of life, of letting go with our breath, of being in prayer with our breath. May we be open to the possibility that we need not pick up our worries again. Instead, may we find passion and strength to work for a change where the chances come for us to have the power to do so and to let go where we do not. And so we thank you for this moment where we can gather, where we can breathe, where we can accept ourselves and celebrate life in the midst of challenge, and to know that you are always as close as our breath to us. Amen. We now hear uh, from Ian uh, in our scripture reading day from the book of Ecclesiastes. Good morning. The book of Ecclesiastes is an interesting read and is known as wisdom literature. Sean Hannon of Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary states, the writer's honesty is a breath of fresh air. While their stark speech takes some getting used to, once given a hearing, one notices they are onto something. Here is one who has tried and tried again to legitimize and or justify their life through reason. In the end, it cannot be done. No wonder the writer is frustrated. Perhaps they air their frustration to help those who have done the same and concluded the same. The writer keeps it real and invites us to approach life in this way also. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verses 1 through 15. The words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hurries to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Round and round goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, 
but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they continue to flow. All things are wearisome, more than one can express. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, or the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new. It has already been in the ages before us. The people of long ago are not remembered, nor will there be any remembrance of people yet to come by those who come after them. I, the teacher, when, when king over Israel and Jerusalem, apply my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun and see all is vanity and a chasing after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight and what is lacking cannot be counted. May the Holy Spirit bless our understanding and help us to live the truth we hear. Amen.
our children's book today is What Can You Do With a Chance? It's written by uh, Colby Mayada and illustrated by May Beesum. What do you do with a chance? Let's find out. One day, I got a chance. It just seemed to show up. It acted like it knew me as if it wanted something. I didn't know why it was here. What do you do with a chance, I wondered. It fluttered around me. It brushed up against me. It circled me as if it wanted to grab me. I started to reach for it, but I was unsure and pulled back. And so it flew away. I thought about it a lot. I wish I had taken my chance. I realized I had wanted it, but I still didn't know if I had the courage. When another chance came around, I wasn't so sure, but I decided to try. I went to reach for it, but I missed and fell. I was embarrassed. I felt foolish. It seemed like everyone was looking at me. I decided I never wanted to feel this way again. So after that, whenever a chance came along, I ignored it. And the more I ignored them, the less they came around. Until one day, I noticed that I hadn't seen a chance in quite a while. It was as if they had all disappeared. I started to worry, what if I don't get another chance? I know I acted like I didn't care, but the truth was I did. I still wanted to take a chance, but I was afraid. And I wasn't sure if I would ever be brave enough. Then I thought, maybe I don't have to be brave all the time. Maybe I just need to be brave for a little while at the right time. I realized it was up to me. I promised myself that if I ever got another chance, I wasn't going to hold back. If I got another chance, I was going to be ready. Then one seemingly ordinary day, I saw something shining far off in the distance. Is it possible? I hoped. Could this be my chance? I had to find out. I ran as hard and as fast as I could towards it. I, know, I didn't know how to explain it, but the second I let go of my fears, I was full of excitement. It wasn't that I was no longer afraid, but now my excitement was bigger than my fear. And as I got closer, I could see that this was a really huge chance. But this time, I was ready. As it came by, I reached out and grabbed it. I held on with all my might. It felt so good to soar, to fly, to be free. I now see that when I hold back, I miss out. And I don't want to miss out. That's just so much I want to see and do and discover. So what do you do with a chance? You take it because it might be the start of something incredible. What do you do with a chance? Written by Colby Yamamata and illustrated by May Beesum. What do you do with a chance? Well, you know, as we, we heard from the author of Ecclesiastes, it sometimes it feels like, uh, well, are there any chances, or is everything just this, this world of things happening to us? You know, like uh, the Beatles sang the song, for every season, for every matter under heaven there is a season. In some ways, you know, the book of Ecclesiastes is such a, it's a book that humbles me. I don't know about you. It's a book that sort of is realistic about life, that life is full of a lot of stuff. And the writer just keeps talking about how they, they have this term, vanities of vanities. Uh, one way to translate that is perfectly pointless. So they were saying, 
No, sometimes life just feels perfectly pointless, and no matter what you do uh, and what you try and grab onto, uh, whatever you grab onto is fleeting, and it all leads to more perfectly pointless living. I don't know, do you, do you ever feel like that? Uh, do you feel like that sometimes with all that's happening in personally or communally in the world? I do sometimes. I, I think of climate change. <laughs> I think it's perfectly pointless sometimes. I don't know, are we ever going to get there? Uh, I sometimes think of my own imperfections and fallibles. Will I ever change? Maybe it's all perfectly pointless. And there's other people and other things. And, and it really hit home this week when, uh, well, when I had to sort of deal with reality. Our yard has sort of become this nature preserve for some reason in Lethbridge. I, it's not what I've planned or Rebecca's plan, but, you know, about five weeks, maybe six weeks ago, we had a herd of 15 deers in the front yard. And now we don't have any tulips because of it. We should have like hundreds. <laughs> um, we have lots of birds, which is good. We you know we have our blue jays and our and our finches and our um, grackles and there's so many others and they're good and, and then we have lots of peanuts through the yard because of that. And then just recently, and I didn't know how to really approach this, we suddenly had a little bunny in the backyard. Now I grew up on a farm and so we're, we're not really, you know, that open-hearted to bunnies and other things and deers, you know, they eat stuff. But suddenly we had these two little, and my heart opened up, adorable little bunnies. They're they're, they're really not rabbits, they're hares. And they had found a home underneath our shed in the backyard. And there was, uh, at first I thought there was only one, but then suddenly there were two, and they came out in the morning, and they they do an excellent job of mowing the yard. Uh, They keep the grass down for me so I don't have to mow in some parts. And they don't actually eat it so much that it kills it. They're very environmental bunnies. And, and so it's sort of, you know, I woke up in the morning, look out the window, and there, there they are. They're like this delight. <laughs> you know, I go out in the afternoon, and they're playing with each other. But then suddenly, it just all seemed perfectly pointless because this cat came. <laughs> this cat. Now, I'm not against cats, so if you're a cat person, this is not against cats. But this is, you know, this is the cycle of like this, this cat came, and it became this running battle between me and that cat. It would sit right in the, in, the, in the dusk of the evening before the bunnies came out to eat. It would sit waiting for them, and, and I would sneak out the front door through the back gate of the yard, and it would catch my eye, and it was, it was sort of a, a, the, the eye of, I, just, I shouldn't project onto it, but just had this evil intention. <laughs> it, it wanted to get those bunnies, and I wanted to protect them. So there became this running battle where I'd go out, I'd scare it over the fence, and it became where, you know, it became this sort of big metaphor for me of life. The bunnies became the way, you know, you know, nature is just being destroyed in our world. And the, the cat became more than the cat. The cat became all the ways as our society just doesn't protect nature and the environment. And we just keep doing the same thing and it all seems pointless. And I just, I felt like I wanted some control in my life. I can't change much. At least I can protect these bunnies. Because, you know, the truth is, uh, and again, nothing against cats, is that they're introduced species to Canada. You know, they, cats kill a lot of songbirds. They kill a lot of stuff. And in some ways, if we have cats, we should keep them inside. Because they're just being cats. <laughs> you know, cats are cats. They have their own personalities. They do their own things. They're much like us. That's why we love them. But for me, it was like, it just became this pointless thing. It's like I've impermanent my face. And so the, after days of doing this, suddenly there was only one bunny. 
And then unfortunately, in the last couple of days, we just got up, there were no bunnies. But you see, this is, this is what the, the writer of Ecclesiastes is trying to talk about. You know, the word vanity in Hebrew is haval. And it means all this. It means, um, as we'll see in the slide, it means that which is fleeting. Uh, it's ephemeral. It's puffed up. You, can, you could translate vanity as wind that cannot be grasped or vapor or fog or mist. Like you just can't grab onto it. Vanity is delusion or nonsense or futile. Or finally, it's impermanence. So vanity is not about, oh, don't I look great? That's not what they're meaning when you hear that over and over. It's not about, oh, oh I just look wonderful. <laughs> no, it's not that. That's not vanity. It means that the way our creations created, our life, everything, is that we, that we have, first of all, these constructs of the way we think life should be. And then the other thing is that we think is that we think life is so certain and we can control it and we can hang on to it. But what we discover as we grow older is, is that there's all parts of our life that we grab onto something, we think it's certain, we make our life out of it, and then poof, it disappears. The pandemic has really done a number on us. And part of us are just fighting to force our ways back to what we thought was certain and make it happen. But what the writer of Ecclesiastes says, it's, it's fleeting. It's vapor, it's mist. If you do that, well. So how, how do we work with this? How, how do we work with this? Well, I want to just briefly talk to you about four categories of acceptance in our lives. The first one is this. If this is really true, our first thing we need to accept is there's a spectrum of impermanence to life. What's this mean? Well, James Finley said this, as all of us have a wick burning, we're all a candle with a wick burning, but some of our wicks are shorter than others, and some of ours are burning faster than we really think. You know, that, that's, that's the impermanence. Life, death, birth, rebirth, everything in, in nature is all going through this process. All of matter is impermanent. It, and it's not something to be scared of, but everything is impermanent. Relationships, People will betray us. Things happen out of the blue. Just look what happened in southern Ontario with the storm going through and, and all that's happening. We, we, just, we have all this impermanence. My hair is going out of the top of my head for some reason. You know, we, we get gray, we age. All these things. And nature is the same way. And so the question is, is can we accept impermanence. Can we accept change? Because that's what the first thing is the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying. There's always going to be change. And if you try and base your life on an unchanging life, well, it's perfectly pointless in the end. Or you'll find out that. It feels like that. It doesn't mean it was pointless. But it has that feeling. The second spectrum is this, which we already touched on. It's sort of a subset. It's the spectrum of fragility. We're very fragile people. No, we are. We're, we're fragile. Our earth is fragile. Everything is fragile. And I don't mean this is in a negative or, or a terrible way, but it's something we have to come to accept. You know, we all, you know, we, when we're in our 20s, in our 30s, we think we can do anything. When you become in your 40s and go to your 50s, well, you, just, you discover that your body changes. And, and then you discover as you go older and older, well, one of my mentors, Joyce Bleeby, who is this little, little American Australian about this big and wore a Cobra hat, says, you know, our, our fragility of our lives is like we're a car. And as we keep going on and get older and older, the bumper falls off, the, the, the tailpipe stops working. The window cracks. I mean, all these things. There's a fragility to life. 
I don't know about you, but part of the acceptance is can we accept our fragility? Sometimes we're healthy. Sometimes we're unwell. Sometimes we're struggling. And then sometimes we're coping. But it's a fact of life. And the writer of Ecclesiastes, you read it, talks about all these ways. There's, there's this spectrum of fragility. And one way or another in our human experience, we're all going to have this experience. We cannot escape it. Well, the, that leads to the third one in a way. The third acceptance. A spectrum of failure and imperfection. Maybe, maybe you want to tune out right now. It's like, holy moly. I just want to get a half bottle of Chianti and some brownies and uh, you know, get on Netflix and just tune out of everything. And that's what we do sometimes when, when we realize that life's impermanence, there's this spectrum of fragility, and we're going to fail. And we're imperfect. And sometimes we're imperfect just because the way our genetics are, the way our body's built, our family history, the way our mind works, and it's perfectly imperfect perfection but it's just the way we are. Things are happening when we can't do anything about it. I mean, I don't know, do you ever fail? I know we don't like to talk about failure. It's like, oh my goodness. But, we, but it's just, you know, we must be failing. If you look at the way our, our world structure, it's like we still allow wherever the center of power is, psychopaths to take over. You know, that's, you know, the author of Dune, Frank Herbert, said um, in a quote, he said that all power eventually attracts psychopaths because that's the nature of power. And so as, you know, as a bigger system of failure and perfection, no matter what type of government we have as a species, we're always attracting psychopaths. Putin? I don't know. I shouldn't. I don't know. Our last premier? I don't know. Maybe not. But that's what power does, you know, it, it's, and so our whole system, it's like, you know what, I fail, I fail miserably at times. I fail over and over in the same thing. I go to counseling and think that I, my life has changed, I have changed, and then two or three later, I do the same thing over, and I have to go understand what's going on, and so we have this spectrum of failure and imperfection which is part of this in impermanence. And so the question is, you know, can we accept that we're imperfect? Can we accept that we fail? And then can we accept forgiveness? Because in all of these ones, whether it's a spectrum of impermanence, a spectrum of fragility, a spectrum of failure and imperfection, if we don't start accepting the things, what happens? This is what happens. What happens is, is, is this quote in this next slide. It says, the resistance and the degree of resistance to the natural phenomena of life causes tremendous suffering. That's what the book of Ecclesiastes is part of about. If we resist the way life really is, we actually create more suffering. And the Buddha said this too, to bring it, you know, it is your resistance to what is that causes your suffering. And you know what really happens when we get caught in this? So when we resist that we're, you know, we resist um, impermanence, we, we resist fragility, you know, that we're born, we live, uh, we age, as Buddha says, and then we get sick and suffer and die we resist that, if we resist that, we're going to fail sometimes, that we're imperfect, not because there's something terribly wrong with us, just because of who we are. What happens then is we do what we talked about last week, which is really the fourth, fourth um, acceptance. It's our spectrum of humanity. When we get so tied up in fighting all those other things and fighting what the world tells us we should be, then we deny who we are like we talked about last week. We don't accept ourselves. We don't accept our body. We don't accept our sexuality. We don't accept our gender fluidity. We don't accept ourselves, and we create even more suffering for ourselves and others. 
So, you know, when I say acceptance, I'm not trying to say we're like a lab dog that rolls over on their back when they see you and wants you to scratch their belly like good lab, lab, lab dogs want. Acceptance is actually working skillfully and mindfully with our resistance and with the way life is. And so, really, can we love and accept ourselves? Can we love impermanence? Can we, can we love and accept fragility? Can we love and accept imperfection and failure? It's really saying, can we, can we grieve when we have to let go of the concepts in our heads? Can we be more open and wonder and have curiosity? And what this does is it really reminds me of grace. Now, that's a double entendre there, but it reminds me of Grace from South Africa, who, through acceptance of impermanence and fragility and failure and imperfection, uh, she finds another chance, as we hear. My mom always say that I don't give up. People have disappointed me in my life so many times, but I will never give up on love. I will do it over and over again because I feel like maybe at a certain time I did it, the person was not ready. I will never give up on, you know, being affectionate, empathetic to other human beings because I think that is our sense of being human. It comes from there to be able to have emotion and also to show emotions to other human beings. So my grandmother passed away in 2016. And her name was Grace. I'm named after her. She passed on before she could even see my kids. She got sick like Monday, and then Friday she passes away. You know, I feel. She knew I had a child, but she never saw my kids. So it's almost like in African culture, some sort of blessing. I, I, I maybe I wanted her to touch them. I don't know. <laughs> Loss is one of the things that I don't deal best with. It's something that is painful and it shatters my heart. It, I don't want, I don't wish it even upon my worst enemy. I wish I could have done a lot of things for her to, to kind of show appreciation. Little things, you know, we used to buy her things, but I think those things, it's material things. Yeah, she, for, that is why I wanted to spend time with her. My journey of climbing mountain only happens after her passing. And I think it was me looking for a sign for her to say, it's okay. 
Maybe that is why I go to the mountain so much. You climb a mountain, you know, there is that spiritual connection that you get when you're on top of the mountain. Whatever that you're going through in that moment seems to fade away. Those things just disappear and it's just you on top of the mountain and you look out and then you just see the horizon. I think right now she's looking at me and she's saying that, you know what, Lukwalaka, well done. And and she is happy of the woman I have become. And I'm, I'm thankful for everything that she has taught me. So my wish for my kids, I want them to know that they must not feel like they have to be accountable to me. I don't want them to live their life thinking that they have to please me. They must not live their life saying that I want to make mom happy. I want them to live like I want to make me happy because of your parents will be happy as long as you are happy. I don't want to impose my dreams onto them. I don't want to impose what I feel I failed at at life onto them. I want them to be themselves. Whatever that they have, they feel like it's their talent, it's what they are born with, it's their gift. I want them to share it with the world. I'm grateful for being alive, being able to be with my family, being able to go out and climb mountains. I'm grateful for that. Live in the moment, live for today. You are getting a present right now. Open it up and just leave it. That it's that it's what I believe. I, I love uh, Grace's story. It's not linear. It's not neat and tidy. It's the book of Ecclesiastes. It's her facing all this impermanence in her life, loss, failure, what she wants the future to look like for her kids. And in it, she, she sort of discovers what happens when you accept this all, maybe even imperfectly too is that as she said, you know, life is here right now, in this moment. Or as our book told us, there's always another chance. You know, the book of Ecclesiastes, if you keep reading on, sort of says the same thing. You know, it goes on for quite a few chapters. You know, the pointlessness, it does suggest eat, drink, and be merry, not hedonism but live in the present moment. And finally says, you know what? If you look in your heart, if you want to say this theologically, there's God. God's with us in the impermanence, in the loss, in the new chances. We are not alone. And so this is the invitation to us. Are you willing to practice imperfectly accepting Life as life, knowing that there is always another chance waiting for you no matter what is happening. Amen. I invite us to join together now in singing uh, hymn number 278 if you want to follow along in your hymn book or be on our screen in the quiet curve of evening.
And for each other, let us pray. O Spirit of life, as we join together in this moment of prayer, of letting go, of our heart's deepest yearnings, of looking for new chances, help us to have courage and presence and help fear not overwhelm our hearts. For we acknowledge in this time of prayer, O God, that sometimes life does feel cruel. It does feel overwhelming. It does feel out of control. It does feel like not what we prepared for or wanted or planned for. And so we pray that our eyes might be open and our ears might hear and our hearts might feel a touch of warmth and light and that we may trust that no matter what has happened, what we've done or not done, what others have said about us, or what or even we believe about ourselves, that there is another chance flying around us, inviting us to grab it as we hold both fear and excitement. And so, we pray for all the ways we resist life and resist the flow of life and the ways we create suffering for ourselves and each other in our world. And we ask that we may be touched by grace this day and enlivened by grace to know that you're always with us. And so we pray for all those places in our lives and the world where we're looking for another chance and for grace. We pray for those who are struggling from illness of body or mind or spirit. We pray for all of us who are grieving, grieving over the death of a loved one, grieving over our fragility, grieving over our failures, grieving over the impermanence of life where we've had changed relationships, our jobs have changed, where we worry about money or survival. And we pray 
for where resistance is creating such suffering in the world, for homophobia, transphobia, for prejudice, for racism, for elitism. We pray where power has been corrupted and violence is the name of the game, O oh Christ. Where so many are crucified for such cruel and inhumane reasons that there may be grace and a second chance in our world. And we also pray, Spirit of love, for our Mother Earth, who is groaning with all the cosmos for us to awaken and to walk humbly upon her and with each other to create a community of respect and love and authenticity. And so we gather all these prayers together with the one prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our breathing life, who art in everything, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Once again, thank you for being here and on this journey. And thank you for all the ways that you give in your life, that you give to those you love, to, to nonprofits, to other people, in your life, and also the way you give to us here at MacKillop. There are many ways you can give. If you want, you can give online at our website that's listed on the slide. Um, we do have a new feature at the back for those who are in person. There is a QR code. <laughs> the church is trying to keep up with technology. You know, where you, where you get your cell phone out and you scan the QR code, it'll take you to ways to give if, if you'd like to give to help us continue on this ministry of being a community that seeks to grow in how we're inclusive, our diversity, and that we're all on a spiritual journey together. And if you want more information about us, there's always lots of information on our Facebook page, or our, U our, our not, and then you can go to our YouTube page too, or on our website. And as you leave today, if you're interested, on your right as you leave, there's um, information about Pride Month coming up in Lethbridge and ways that you can support or help. Free, feel free if you want to take a, a flag home in support of uh, Pride Month or there's Pride Pins and our first Sunday of June in um, is going to be Pride Sunday uh, at MacKillop, and it's, it's, it's a Sunday in all United Churches in Canada for Pride Sunday. And also uh, then we'll be part of the Pride Parade, I think it's on June the 25th, which is, hasn't happened for the last two years because of COVID. Well, I don't know if the little bunny's going to come back. When I got up this morning and I looked out the window, I saw something else, though. There was a big bunny by our shed. So maybe there's another chance. I don't know. But that's what we've heard today, and that's what we hear in our visual benediction, that there is always another chance. And the earth herself, which is a presence of the divine, is always inviting us to wake up to that. And after our visual benediction, we're joined together in singing, Guide Me, O Thy Great Jehovah, hymn number 651. May Christ, who shimmers in all creation, surprise you each day with glittering moments when you can see again how light lives in everything, 
how it partners with dark soil to bring forth aster and lavender, rosemary and daffodils, a hundred kinds of squash, kale and cabbage, apple and berry, grapes sweetened by the sun, how the dough you need in your hands is an alchemy of touch and time, how everything is a call to communion, the wafer of moon, a chalice of stars, let the mystery of it all dance in your heart, always widening your horizons, inhabiting new landscapes. Thank you.